Bueno, yo estoy eh, muy contenta de eh, arrancar con nuestra primer conferencia magistral eh, del cuarto congreso de la Sociedad Samuel Beckett. Y para mí, eh, como ustedes saben, algunos de las personas que he tenido la oportunidad de conocer en, en Reading, eh, uno de los eh, grupos de académicos que arropó mis eh, ideas un poco transdisciplinares desde que llegué la primera vez en 2014, eh, fueron Anna McMullen y Everett Frost. Por supuesto, James Nolson también fue una, una gran figura para, para que abrieran esa puerta académica a una artista transdisciplinar convertida en académica de manera tardía. Entonces, eh, yo tengo un, un gran cariño por ambos, tanto por Anna como por eh, Everett, y cuando hablamos hace dos años de la posibilidad de venir a México, fueron los primeros que, que creyeron en esa, en esa idea y por eso en este caso me siento muy honrada de poder presentar a Everett Trefors. El, el otro motivo por el cual eh, me siento también muy honrada es porque eh, mi tema de trabajo, eh, tanto desde el punto de vista artístico y mi práctica, como desde mis investigaciones, eh, tienen que ver con el sonido y con el radio. Yo soy una persona que en alguna de mis vidas anteriores hice radio eh, de tiempo completo y mi formación como estudiante de música y posteriormente mi formación en los estudios de la radio de Universidad de Guadalajara eh, fue fundamental para tener una concepción del mundo y en ese sentido me siento especialmente eh, ligada a un productor de radio como es Everett Sefrost y para mí es un honor estar aquí sentada en el mismo lugar con él, es realmente un honor. Entonces, dejando las cosas personales, pero que implica para mí la importancia de poderlo introducir, eh, me une también este, el tercer, la tercera línea a la que yo quisiera hacer referencia, me une esta parte de ser... Eh, un profesional de un medio de comunicación, un especialista del habla desde esa perspectiva de la radio que es tan especial, eh, y luego hacer este cambio y meter eh, la cuchara en todo lo que es hacer la reflexión profunda que necesita y requiere la academia. Entonces esa es la, la, la tercera cosa que, que me une a Everett, no sé si Everett tenía esto, es, esta, estos antecedentes, pero… Es, es, es por lo que me hace estar tan contenta presentándolo esta mañana. Eh, voy a leer eh, de manera sucinta su currículum, eh, todos los perfiles de todos los participantes están en la página web eh, del festival, de este congreso de eh, México eh, Transdisciplinar Beckett, la página web es www.beckett-cortomexico.org, pero… Diremos de manera muy sucinta que Ever Frost produjo y dirigió los estrenos de cinco obras completas para radio, que fueron las ganadoras del premio eh, norteamericano eh, para la radiodifusión. Eh, de, en general, prácticamente todas las obras menos una que realizó Beckett para este medio, eh, entre los cuales los actores que fueron eh, incluidos en estas producciones fueron Billy Whitelow, eh, David Marlowe, Barry McGovern y Alvin Epstein. Eh, él trabajó mano a mano con Beckett en el diseño de estas obras, eh, por lo tanto eh, recibió varios, eh, por supuesto, sugerencias y consejos de parte de Samuel Beckett. Entonces, en ese sentido tenemos a un académico y a un productor, eh, a un hombre del sonido que trabajó mano a mano con, con Samuel Beckett aquí entre nosotros y eso es algo que debemos de reconocer y de, de, nos sentimos nosotros como organizadores muy honrados. Eh, entre otras otras cosas, eh, por ejemplo, para Words and Music y por sugerencia de Beckett, encargó una composición a Morton Feldman, de ahí viene Words and Music con ese, con ese reparto que nosotros eh, esperemos poder recuperar y presentar en 2019, era parte de nuestros proyectos como parte de la, del Congreso. Ha publicado también Everett Frost sobre Beckett, eh, radio, radiodrama, teoría de los medios, eh, ha escrito sobre, por ejemplo, Brecht y Benjamin, fue el principal compilador del catálogo de las notas de lectura de Beckett, eh, escritas en Trinity College, eh, ha sido editor de la edición de Faber and Faber, All Don't Fall, Another Place for Radio, entre muchas otras cosas. Eh, 
yo creo que en Everett encontramos a un profesional de los medios, a un hombre que ha hecho una gran reflexión sobre el, el medio del sonido, sobre el habla, eh, a un hombre que ha trabajado y que trabajó eh, con Samuel Beckett y pues para nosotros es un honor tenerlo aquí y que comparta su, su trabajo reciente con nosotros. Muchas gracias, Everett. Muchas gracias. I understood the general gist of it, but I, I, hope, I hope she didn't tell too many things. <laughs> but thank you very much for such a splendid introduction. We begin. When, and I'm used to doing things standing up at a podium so that I know what to do with the papers, but this seems to work very nicely. When disciplines, We, we, okay, now we stop fidgeting and start talking. When disciplines like those who serve them cross borders, they enrich each other. And I want to thank Melissa Maria Sanchez. Mm. I'm thinking about the borders. And the conference organizers and underwriters for this opportunity to participate in this Beckett International Foundation Transdisciplinary Conference. My title alludes to a book by Octavio Paz, The Other Voice, in which he describes his early work as, quote, a disorderly digression on the two extremes of poetic and human experience, solitude and communion, which seems a thing he has in common with Samuel Beckett. And about other such things that he has in common, I will look forward to hearing from uh, Christopher Dominguez uh, Michael's new keynote on Saturday, which apparently is on Paz and Beckett, which I think will be very interesting indeed. <clears throat> Solitude and communion is a dialectic that I am hardly the first to regard as central to Beckett's work, and I, which I will draw upon for transdisciplinary discussion of some technical, practical aspects of radio drama production from my experience placed in the context of some disorderly dig digressions of my own into Beckett's philosophical investigations and creative reasons why radio, let's see, all these things here, Uh, uh, all, uh, from my experience placed in the context of some disorderly digressions of my own into Beckett's philosophic investigations of the creative reasons why radio became an important part of the development of his work. I think that worked, it did. <clears throat> It's hard to imagine the sense of awe that the ability to communicate wireless through the ether invoked at its inception. Broadcast. The word is derived from the agricultural term for randomly scattering seeds, like a radio, as opposed to planting them one by one in furrows, like a telephone. Radio, with its potential for dispensing sound originating in one place to listeners everywhere was, before we got accustomed to it, experienced as something miraculous, as if the wireless had discovered the ineffable way God communicates with mortals. Radio dislocated sound from its source, a phenomenon that Armory Schaefer in his seminal study, The Tuning of the World, aptly named schizophonia, to refer to the split between an original sound and its electroacoustic re reproduction or transmission. And similar to, the, similar to the term acousmatic used by the French composer Pierre Schaeffer, not to be confused with, not to be confused with R. Murray Schaeffer, and Michel Chion, and defined as sounds one hears without seeing their originating cause. In the decade leading up to Beckett's involvement in it, Radio benefited from another major source of schizophrenia, the tape recorder. Audio tape was better for broadcasting than wax cylinders, discs, or wire recordings because it made, it made two distinct capabilities possible, convenient storage of sound and the creative manipulation of it. A whole drama could be recorded in one or two reels of audio tape, making it simple to record at one time and broadcast it at another enabling welcome flexibilities. For example, an actor to appear in an evening radio drama even though performing somewhere else in a play at the same time. It made repeated broadcast and wider distribution of the same program possible. From this point of view, the tape recorder became the means to move the proscenium arch of the theater into the living rooms of the nation and indeed the world. Second, in addition to storage and easy duplication of a program, tape recorders made the signal processing of sound possible. Audio tape can be cut up, edited, played backwards, slowed down, speeded up, subjected to infinite technical modifications, enabling recording and re-recording, like film, out of sequence, 
or assembling the desired performance from, from a variety of takes. It makes it possible to acquire sounds recorded in the soundscape rather than generated in the studio and to process, overdub, combine, mix them with each other. It's a lot of fun. <coughs> Tape recording and studio production became radios and the recording industries and film and television's transdisciplinary gateway to innovative and experimental dramatic and acoustic forms. In general, BBC radio drama initially regarded audio tape as a, primarily as a way to store programs and lagged behind other broadcast systems in exploring its production possibilities. But the success of All That Fall, among other things, made it possible for the more progressive members of the radio drama staff, such as Donald McWinney, the director of the original All That Fall, and Barbara Bray, to combine forces with their colleagues in the music department and technical staff to argue successfully for more advanced recording and production studios, resulting in 1958 in the development of the Maida Vale Radiophonic Studios, shamefully closed in 1998, with Desmond Briscoe as its co-founder and first manager. The BBC was eager for Beckett to provide a successful sequel to All That Fall, and Beckett, as he wrote to Thomas McGreevy, his friend, had found the experience of working with the BBC a pleasant one, and having learned something about radio technique, hoped to continue to work with him. Beckett's intersection with radio came at a crucial period for both himself and the BBC. Under the pressure of diminishing audiences and abandoning it for, abandoning it for television, BBC Radio began looking for serious drama that went beyond adaptations of prose fiction and stage dramas, and stage dramas, <coughs> prose fiction and stage dramas, and were radio specific, genuinely exploring the character of the medium that was heard but not seen as an advantage and not as an obstacle to be overcome. Despite his insistence to Donald McWinney that my ideas about radio are not even a quarter baked, Beckett's extensive reading in philosophy, psychology, and film studies, and his post-war familiarity with French radio gave him an appreciation of radiophonic aesthetics and its developing technologies. As early as his Proust monograph, Beckett's regard for the radiographical quality of Proust's narrator's attention to the soundscape anticipates his soundscape in All That Fall. In ironic form, spectral supernatural voices coming out of the dark or as a form of possession from within the mind are a staple of folklore, ghost story. Did I do that? It did. <clears throat> are a staple of, of folklore, ghost stories, horror movies, and popular drama, and also uh, religious mysticism and so on. But invisible presence, presences also derive from philosophical, theological, and psychological traditions in which hearing voices is an archetype of divine inspiration or the result of solitude and introspection. Beckett was thoroughly familiar with these traditions and as a young man made extensive notes on many of their theorists among them the post-Cartesian philosopher Arnold Herlinx, who emphasized the central importance of solitude, a steady and deliberate withdrawal of the mind from external distractions, no matter how pressing they may be, into the interior recesses of the self. Herlinx, among others, is a significant source of Beckett's disembodied voices located both within and beyond the mind as a narrative strategy. He observes that God does not whisper secrets into the ear, but speaks plainly, and that I hear clearly enough <clears throat> that which confers with or violates his will, but for the din made by this tinkling ear pen pendant of my beads and desires. These are translations, my translation from Beckett's Latin notes in Trinity College Dublin from the works of Arnold Herlinx. Such distractions from hearing and self-examination appear throughout Beckett's work, appearing sometimes as a buzzing such as the one that keeps the logaritic monologues of not I from the pronoun that might free her from compulsion. <clears throat> the mystery of the voice, and I'm quoting uh, Chris Ackley and Stan Guntarski here, may be finally Beckett's most profound literary creation. The mystery consists of where the voice is located, whether within or without <clears throat> voices overheard and voices in the head per per pervade Beckett's post-war fiction and confirm an affinity with radio that precedes his engagement with it. 
The first person monologue is repeating words overheard in the trio of novels, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable, prepare the, for the schizophrenic, schizophonic interiorities of the radiophonic dramas to come, and demonstrates a problem that the radio helps to solve. The three novels gave rise to the advent of refinement of first-person stream of consciousness monologues, originating in a voice in the head. In them, narration evolves from Malloy writing the voice down to the unnameable spoken monologue that prepares for and anticipates Beckett's radiophonic dramas and the disembodied voices and spectral presences of the late television plays, prose text, and so on. I'm in my mother's room, says Malloy, or writes Malloy. Malloy is a first-person narrator, writing down a narrative of how he got there at the requirement of at the requirement and for the perusal of unknown others, one of whom comes periodically to take away new pages, <clears throat> if there are any, and bring back the old ones marked for correction. Throughout Malloy, the distinction between writing and speaking is muddy. There's a man who comes every week. He gives me money and takes away the pages. So many pages, so much money. What I'd like to do now is speak of the things that are left, say my goodbyes, and finish dying. In Malloy, the premise is that the text we read originates in the voices that Malloy overhears, which are written down along with reflections on the duress of having to do so. And if I went on listening to that far whisper, says, it says in <coughs> Malloy, a silent long sense in which I still hear, I would, I would still learn more about this, but I will listen no longer for the time being <coughs> to that far whisper, for I do not like it, I fear it but it is not a sound like other sounds that you listen to when you choose and can sometimes silence by going away or stopping your ears. No, but it is a sound which begins to rustle in your head without you knowing how or why. It's with your head that you hear it, not with your ears. You can't stop it, but it stops itself when it chooses. It makes no difference whether I listen or not. I shall hear it always. Just as Joyce's HCE, here comes everybody, absorbs all the characters in Finnegan, all the other characters in Finnegan's Wake, the unnameable absorbs all of Beckett's other characters into himself. He tells us that the trouble with these predecessors is that, quote, it was clumsily done. You could see the ventriloquist, i.e. the hand of the author putting the words in the mouths, or the, the self-conscious interference with the illusion. But the narrator of the unnameable is on a pilgrimage, which is an unironic one, because unlike that of Bunyan's Everyman, it doesn't lead anywhere, not even to starting over again, as in Joyce's Viconian Recorso, but merely to endless repetition of quotidian badinage, an inaccessible end that cannot be achieved either by waking up or by death, but by, but by arriving at the obliteration of self-consciousness, and at the same time being aware that it is occurring i.e. while being conscious of not being conscious, a condition as unattainable as it is unnameable. He is ironically analogous to the child who is unaware that she exists because she'd never really been born, a psychological case disturbingly remembered by Beckett from a Carl Jung lecture and often repeated. The unnameable speaks directly. His logarithmic effusions are to be understood as if they were being heard. The style shifts according from that of prose fiction to the lilt and rhythms of oral narrative. And Beckett's narrative strategy has evolved from the conventions that Malloy is writing down to what he hear, writing down what he hears to the unnameable, imagined as an autonomous monologist, not writing, but saying himself into existence. As Anna McMullen writes in another context, the scenic image can therefore be seen as a materialization of the process of self-creation represented by the fictional autobiographical text. The creator creates himself through the narrative or is created by it. And in the end of the quote. As with from an abandoned work, he is a figment of the words he says, and these invite audio production. He is divisor of the voice and of its hearing and as of himself divisor of himself or company, leave it at that. He speaks of himself as of another. He devises two for company, leave it at that. Have I got the right one up there? There, there we go. That's the last quote on that page. <clears throat> 
The integration of heard and said word is articulated in an extraordinary passage from the unnameable. I'm sorry, I've got it mixed up here. What am I doing? I'm sorry, I apologize for getting this messed up. We go back one. This is this is not working. All right, I'll just read it. <clears throat> this should be the eighth slide. Tell me what I feel and I'll tell you, this is the unnameable speaking. Tell, you, tell me what I feel and I'll tell you what, who I am. They'll tell me who I am. I won't understand, but the thing will be said. They'll have said who I am and I'll have heard without an ear. I'll have heard and I'll have said it. I'll have said it inside me, then in the same breath outside me. Perhaps that's what I feel, an outside and an inside and in me and me in the middle. Perhaps that I wanna, that's what I am, the thing that divides the world in two. On the one side, the outside. On the other side, the inside. They can be as thin as a foil. I'm in the middle. I'm the partition. I'm the tympanum. I'm the one hand, the mind. On the other, the world. I don't belong to either. And to me, that's one of those incredible passages Beck ever wrote. Hearing Patrick McGee reading excerpts from Malloy and from an abandoned work on the BBC, Beckett experienced the remarkable capability of radio to verbalize a mental monologue such as the ones with which he had been struggling in L'Innamable, which he was translating into the unnameable in Coulonce. Like the interfering net in a tennis match making the game possible, the heard but not seen limitation of radio made it a unique performance site for exploring the questions of the point of view and narrative of expo expositional strategies that were bedeviling him. Of the Malloy broadcast, Beckett wrote to McWinney, Reception execrable, needless to say, but I got enough, knowing the text so well, to realize the extraordinary quality of the McGee performance. In addition to Hurling's, the inner voice ill heard as a description of a radiophonic voice of which one says, I say it as I hear it, may also owe something to the execrable, execrable radio reception mentioned here and often endured elsewhere. Be that as it may, Radio had transformed Beckett's narrator into an oral, O-R-A-L, enactment to be directly experienced orally, A-U-R-A-L-L-Y, without the mediation of print. It became at once performance and publication at the same time. How it is moves even further in that direction. More dramatically than the complex expository density of the unnameable, it has an oral rhythm and phrasing. For a reading of it at the National Theater, Beckett asked McGee to be to be, to be prepared for, quote, a series of short paragraphs during which panting cordially invited the uttered voice, fragments of an inner voice, ill heard is that of a man lying on his face in the mud, in the dark. I think it is a microphone text to be murmured. And he's actually quoting from how it is there as I hear it and murmur it in the mud. Among the technical rewards of radio, is the intimacy that is possible to establish with the effective use of a, microfo a suitable microphone well placed. Since it, is a, since it is a mechanical wave that vibrates the ear, the sense of sound is closest to touch. At the lowest levels, the low end of a church organ or of a keyboard in a concert, or where you feel it through your bottom, it is touch. Low frequencies are therefore associated with warmth and intimacy. It is what a cello does that a piccolo doesn't. Psychoacoustically, someone speaking softly into your ear from up close has entered your personal space, establishing either an intimate connection or a sense of intrusion, depending on, what, uh, depending on the context. It happens that when a microphone is placed very close to the sound source, it artificially emphasizes the lower frequencies of the voice. It artificially emphasizes the low frequencies of the voice. Hear the difference? For which, and this is, by the way, I really find Mike to do that with. <clears throat> 
for which the technical for which the technical term is proximity and pr proximity effect and predictably there are very nice microphones designed specifically for recording the voice from up close that increase the sense of intimacy effective on decent speakers at home and dynamite on headsets McGee's murmur in the mud is advantaged in this way in the Beckett Festival of Radio Plays all at fall we used two microphones on Billy Whitelaw, one up close from Matty Rooney's ruminations, I used none but the simplest words, and a more distant one for her sometimes robust interaction with the other characters. The unnameable being translated into English as Beckett struggled with the monologues and flashbacks of Embers suggests that radio prompted a further evolution from an oral to an oral strategy, from the development of the voice in the head of Matty Rooney to that of Henry and Embers. In Embers, Beckett created a radio play in which the drama depended on being heard without the interference of being seen, in which any attempt at visualization would be a distraction. The play makes an even more radical use of radio's unique potential for mental interiorities than All That Fall does. While our understanding of Maddie, Maddie Rooney's world is shaped by being seen entirely for, for her point of view, she is sufficiently in contact with a normative one for the play to be recognizable as a conventional radio drama hence the temptation to stage it. The interiority of embers is neither so self-evident nor so intelligible. The play is perceived entirely from within the mind of Henry, the, plain's, the play's main, perhaps only, character, and like the monologue, monologuist from, uh, from an abandoned work, he is too obsessed to distinguish what he imagines from what is really there. In our production, it required Barry McGovern to be close to the mic most of the time and backing off when speaking aloud. It was a kind of ballet that went on there. <clears throat> Henry is on the strand or beach beside the sea, like the, like the Cohullan of Irish myth, tempted to plunge into the sea by the sound of the waves. Often armed with a gramophone, literally schizophonic machine that writes with sound, to drown them out, but not today. He tells himself stories to obliterate them. He is an ironic inversion of Cohullan, however, because it's his father's death, not his son's, that has unhinged him. And far from fighting the waves, he is tempted to immerse himself in their peaceful oblivion, as very likely his father had done before him. Attempts to do so are thwarted by Henry's feet, which resist orders to carry him down to the water's edge, one of the second, several rejected titles of the play. He senses, but doesn't know if his father, who doesn't say anything, puts in a spectral appearance. Neither are we sure about his wife, Ada, who famously makes, quote, no sound as she sits and thus may be either an actual physical presence moving silently or a spectral one, conjured or worn out perhaps by his endless talking. Beckett asked that her voice be low and without, remote throughout and without color. This drove us crazy. We recorded her, Billy Whitelaw, in a close mic isolation booth that absorbed rather than reflected sound, creating at once an uncanny effect of intimacy and remote disembodiment. During their conversation, Henry experiences, and the audience hears, flashbacks of their first sexual experience and dramatic flashback scenes from the tormented childhood of their resulting daughter. Once alone, Henry tells stories to evade the temptation to drown himself. In this instance, an old one about Bolton and his, friend, his physician friend, Holloway. Bolton has summoned Holloway on a dark winter's night and begs for an injection. Holloway is willing to comply with a painkiller, but Bolton wants permanent relief, i.e. assisted suicide, and this Holloway refuses. The story is clearly about Henry's own plight, and at the end of the play, Henry stands at the water's edge, and we do not know if this time he chooses to enter it or not. <clears throat> Barbara, despite the, um, uh, the, the fact that it was from Beckett, the BBC higher echelons were not enthusiastic with the script when they saw it, uh, and it took some while before it finally got there. That's a story which I'm omitting here now. Um, and it took Barbara Bray and Donald McWinney to go to town on them and make it possible for them to do it. Um, and at the end of which, Dirk Van Hollen concludes that, quote, in many ways, radio and the BBC became catalysts for Beckett's work in the 1950s in ways that the BBC wasn't entirely happy with. And Beckett himself seems to have been aware of the strange effect of the collaboration with the BBC on his creative production. The thought of the radio and the people involved in broadcasting his prose work seems to have had a paradoxical way of moving his drama 
in a non-radiogenic way. This is uh, Dirk van Heller, not me, in a, in a very fine piece of work. Beckett took, with, Beckett took with him the breakthroughs learned there of, of using radiophonic voices and spectral presences performed to be experienced in other forms than print. Voices enabled by the specific generic requirements of the medium, stage, television, film, out of which they are created. Thus, as Luz Maria Sanchez astutely observes, quote, Beckett, when he came into contact with audio technologies, was able to discover a different way of working with the voice on and off stage. And she fittingly describes the schizophonia of Beckett's hearing McGee on a, reading an open O'Reilly tape recorder in Paris in 1958 as the first of two, technologic, two technological epiphanies, which seems to be a very nice word for that. Quote, the dissociative capacities of the tape recorder, the ability to separate subjects' transmitters from their own voice-transmitted sound. End quote. Such radiophonic revelations created new dis transdisciplinary possibilities that would profoundly modify the direction of Beckett's work and shape the spectral presences of his theater, Footfalls, Ghost Trio, and so on, in a longer version of this essay when it's published, though there'll be uh, sections on those. It proved an inspiration for the McGee monologue that became Crap's last tape. At work on, quote, a short stage monologue for McGee, Beckett asked McWinney for help in obtaining a manual for the operation of a tape recorder. Within the mechanics of, with the mechanics of which I'm unfamiliar. In Crap's last tape, Beckett uses the tape recorder as in Jacques Derrida's phrase, an exteriorization of the memory aid. It is a character conjuring Proustian specters from Crap's past. The 69-year-old Crap listens to a record of himself at 39, in which this younger Crap is in turn remembering himself at 20. Beckett returns to the theme of the impossibility of arresting the transience of human life that he contemplated in his early monograph on Proust. We are not what we were yesterday, and then just quoting from the, Proust, the, the book on Proust that Beckett wrote, the individual is a successor of individuals. That should be the last, if we're lucky here, that's the last, uh, yeah, there we are. And that's the quote in context. As he grows older, crap like Proust Marcel discover li discovers life's ephemerality. His annual recording sessions, schizophonically dis dislocated from their place and time, convey a very different message than the one intended when they were recorded. He makes the agonizing discovery that he is no longer who he was when he made them. The play gains an additional emotional edge if microphone placement on the tape recorded crap is more intimate than, the one, than, than that of the stage voice. The voice of his younger selves bring neither continuity nor solace, but confrontation with the now seeming triviality of his former priorities of artistic aspirations, the vision at last, and the agony of the loss of the girl in the punt. Subsequently in film, the camera becomes a character, like the microphone in the previous one, the victimizing Berkeleyan eye of the self-perception from which, oh, the objectification of it flees in an attempted escape from self-consciousness that proves impossible. Beckett's shooting script is only a starting point and not intended as a text to be read. It is a scenario and explanation for director and technicians, and he himself journeyed to New York, his only trip to America, to participate in its realization. In A. Joe, to take one final example, <coughs> scripted in 65, Beckett considered the relentless probing savage eye of the camera to be the visual component of the audio and schizophonic accusing female voice in Joe's head. Together, they are interrogators, and they make the audience into voyeurs. The voice requires the same proximity effect to create an intimacy violating personal space, creating a combined visual and acoustic close-up to devastating effect. Beckett consulted in the BBC production and but directed the German production himself. The play is no longer a written script. It is a thing realized. Beckett learned from radio. In what he once applied to um, uh, Serge Eisenstein to learn from film, how the performance media and their technology were an integral part of the final drama. Radio is written, as one of my mentors, Peter Leonhard Brown, liked to say, not with a typewriter, but with the recording apparatus and the, rec the production studios. For Beckett, rehearsal and production became not a sequel to the writing process, but a continuation of it. He had increasingly begun to write not for radio, screen, or stage, but with them, assimilating their specific genre characteristics as an integral part of the composition process. 
and using productions, casting, rehearsals, and technical capabilities as part of the script. And he became more and more involved in this aspect of his performance works. Seen from this perspective, the script becomes a set of instructions, like a musical score, for realizing the work in rehearsal and production, and not a text to be read. The result is the work, not the printed text. This is more true of some works than others. The scenarios for film are quad, which famously arrived in its final form when Beckett saw production tapes on black and white TV monitor screen, added to them in the end, aren't very satisfying to read. What where amounts to two plays? The original stage version and Beckett's own adaptation of it for television. The stage version is a better read, but the television adaptation is a more powerfully uncanny experience. The theater version of Not I, with its remote and tiny mouth, flanked by a hapless auditor, is so famously upstaged by the videotape of Billy Whitelaw's full screen, full screen mouth, leaving no room for auditor, that it has deservedly become powerfully iconic and supplants not only text and stage versions, but has become the defining realization of Beckett's extraordinary play. Beckett's inconsistent, inconsistent insistence on the genre specificity of his performance works Resistance to what Ru Ruby Cohn referred to as jumping genres is better understood when it is seen as emanating from the perspective that its genre specifies, is specif specifics are an inextricable part of its composition. In short, Beckett learned from his radio experience and its aftermath to write not for the medium, but with it. His intersection with radio and its immediate ramifications put him closer to achieving the direction for which he admired <clears throat> and in which, as Beckett himself wrote of Joyce's work in progress, form is content, content is form, it is not written at all, it is not to be read, or it is not only to be read, it is to be looked at and listened to. It is not about something, it is that something itself. And thank you very much. <clears throat> And my apologies for the kerfuffles of the, <laughs> the speaker and <laughs> the technology. That's fine. Uh, um, well, I realize you don't have your uh, little translator with you, so I'd rather speak English so mm -hmm. we can communicate because I realize that the introduction, which is good for me now, because, <laughs> you know, you could how I one, introduce you to You could give me one of those widgets and we could do it with me having headphones. No. Either what? way, whatever. What's, it, what's good for you? As you like. Anyhow, um, well, I'm, I, I think uh, as you closed your, your uh, presentation, it was great to say that it, it is the thing, the sound and Beckett. It's not writing for a medium, but the medium itself. And I think that's the that's amazing part of, of, of this author. And, and so, as you quoted, like one of my, my lines uh, has to do with that, with how sound really was the, the object of uh, construction of, of Beckett. So I don't know if uh, somebody in the audience would like to, to open up the dialogue, if you have a question, if you want to uh, uh, make any remarks. Tenemos un micrófono extra, porque por ahí había un tercer micrófono. Paul. Thank you, Everett, for a fascinating talk. Um, my question uh, is about Sorry? the times when sound fails, particularly um, when there are technical failures, like the buzzing and whizzing sounds that, that we sometimes get when the, the equipment doesn't work properly, or, or when sound can't be transmitted properly and can't be received by its intended listener just as Beckett himself couldn't really hear the radio broadcast of his own work um, on that occasion that you mentioned. So I wonder whether you'd like to comment on the failures of sound to transmit um, Beckett's work as well as the, the successes. Well, the only thing that comes to mind is, oh, sorry, get this thing over. The only thing that comes to mind is the uh, fact that he, um, had listening to things when he was in Paris and the BBC was doing things in London, 
uh, it was often difficult for him to hear it. it. The transmission was pretty bad. And there were times when they had to send a tape recorder over to, or he would have to go over to England, and the various versions of the things were different stages of things. Uh, so it was always a problem. And it's just the fact that that was a problem. And uh, that phrase from Herlings about, you know, hearing the, the, um, uh, the actual program, shall we say, th through the tinkling beads of my desires and so on, uh, is something that was just built into the script that the hearing of the voice that he's saying is always murky, and that precedes the radio, and the radio simply uh, added to that. We had to, but looking at it from a production point of view, one has to uh, adapt and and we were very careful about this when we did the, the well, anything I did, um, of making sure that a mono, monaural radio will not have dropouts that are caused by the phase cancellations between the two tracks of the stereo field, so that we would re-monitor some of the things we were doing, we were doing all these crazy, interesting, cute little things, to make sure that they did not interfere with what a simple uh, radio kids carrying around with or sitting in your living room while you do the dishes, that that was the audience too, and uh, we had to we not had to we chose to build into the way in which we presented Beckett um, uh, the assumption not everybody's going to sit down in a room like this and quietly listen, and the BBC does the same thing of course. So there's that I suppose. Thank you. Alguna otra pregunta? Comentario? I. Thank you very much. This is a very broad question. Um, I'm just wondering if you'd agree with the premise of it that there's been a move towards a new discipline of radio studies and sound studies. Um, there's a new book out, The Sound Studies Reader. There's a new anthology, um, Radio Studies. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about why there is increased attention in the world of cultural and literary studies towards sound studies as, as, a, as an object. And also, in a way, the interest in radio at the moment that radio is dying. Um, you know, you're talking about broadcast radio, but we're clearly moving into digital radio now, a very different medium that doesn't broadcast in the ether or comes through a cable in a series of ones and zeros. And I'm just wondering if, if, if there's any connection between the, the death of radio and nostalgia for it. That's a broad question. <laughs> um, the current revival of interest in radio, of course, does nothing but delight me. Um, on the other hand, it's it's more getting more and more limited. The kind of thing that I was doing even into the 1980s and the early 19, 1990s is impossible now. You can't get funding for it and that sort of thing. Um, the extent to which visual, uh, digital radio will, will uh, supplement that because there's an infinite number of channels and so on, and by having lots and lots of room being lots and lots of different things would be a good thing. On the other hand, that isn't what happened to television and you know, the, 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 which you got lots and lots of, of crap and junk food and that sort of thing. But the same is happening on the internet. But the return to sound, um, cell phone is certainly one of them. It's only recently now become a thing you carry around and go walking around looking at, and that's working its way into the culture too. But uh, I've had experience in being, you know, in distant remote places where the only access to this kind of communication is through the radio and so on. Uh, so the cell, the the, the 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 digital technology that the cell phone represents and so on expanded that a lot, so that large regions of the world began to get uh, plugged into something beyond its own tribal perimeters and things like that. That had good effects in some ways of acquainting people with what the world had out there and bad effects of the massive dislocation of people and so on that is going on now. But the answers to those broader complexities, I have no, I don't know, anybody here, when you think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a very important question. It is a very broad question, and I'm not maybe the best guy to answer it in some ways. <laughs> I don't know if that helps at all or not. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? I think we should think about that a lot <laughs> at the UN level and things like that. Um, hello. Um, 
Uh, you mentioned uh, that, you know, that uh, it's through radio he learns to write for the medium. And uh, this reminds me of an ongoing discussion I've had with one of our colleagues who can't be here today, unfortunately, Pim Verhulst. Uh, he argues the same thing. What would you, how, how would you respond to the argument that through the writing of the trilogy and actually the still focusing on the writing strategy of the unwriting, in a certain sense, of the author or the authoritative voice in the unnameable, that he's already learning this strategy, he's already learning this technique, and that he actually maybe improves it with the radio and the radio plays, but it's actually a technique that actually comes from the literature itself. I think that's a summation of what I just tried to say. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, chicken and egg. I can, you know, my point in the Proust thing, which was written in the early 1930s, uh, picking up on, and Proust is an astonishing place to look for a sensitivity to, to uh, soundscapes and radio. Uh, he was picking up on that dimension of it as he was reading that to write the monograph that he wrote, and he picks up on the radiographic quality of things, and um, uh, that kind of experience is certainly part of his motivation to move into film with uh, Eisenstein, which is, I understand it, because Eisenstein at one point wanted to film uh, uh, the last chapter, the, the Nighttown Sad chapter of Ulysses, and by then had moved into sound film, and Beckett wanted to go and spend a year with him. And I never got an answer. There's a letter. The letter is in the collected correspondence of Beckett now. Uh, Beckett never got an answer. And the area didn't get an answer is because in 1936, the Russians are getting ready to invade the Germans. The Nazis are going all over the world but mad. And soon, and somewhere in there, Eisenstein has to split from Mexico because Stalin had killed him and was brought back to be part of the propaganda effort for the fact that the Nazis were coming and, and so on. So that all got lost, in short. And uh, Dorno is by then, and, and not Dorno, um, 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 uh, the great thinker on film and radio and so on, Arnheim, Rudolf Arnheim, uh, was writing his book on radio and running from the Nazis at the same time and ended up finishing up in Boston. It was a, you know, it's a t uh, total terminus. But the point is that the whole idea, the whole conceptual seed of the kind of way Beckett evolved, even his affinity for Joyce and Finnegan's Wake and that kind of thing, was latent, and that some people develop, and some pe you know, some people develop like you know from one thing to another, and some people just sort of open up into a larger and larger thing. Um, and Beckett was one of the kind of just it was all there from the very beginning, incipient, and then it just and the which came first, the enamable or age O is chicken and egg, you know, opportunity and technology and so on. But your perception, I think, is, is spot on. ¿Alguno, ¿Algún otro comentario, pregunta? Pues si les parece, cerramos en este momento, yo creo que esto, esta última reflexión da para muchas otras cosas, esto que fue primero el, el huevo, la gallina, la tecnología, la oportunidad, y creo que en el caso de Beckett, para los que estamos metidos en, este, en esta rama de lo que es la tecnología, es, es muy interesante justamente como una cosa dio lugar a la otra, pero es, es inexplicable. Está, es una cosa pegada eh, también, que es imposible separar. Eh, entonces, yo le agradecería muchísimo, a, le agradezco mucho a Everett Frost, el que esté con nosotros, el que haya sido con el que arrancamos nuestro congreso. Muchísimas gracias. Wonderful. I apologize for the rough edges. I did the best I could.